Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Paul Frields, and welcome to the Tech Talk for Monday, April 9th. So this morning, we've got William Cohen from our Performance Tools Engineering team, and Will's going to talk about using System Tap. With that, go ahead, Will. Okay. So this talk is an introductory talk. Um, I do not expect that you will become experts uh, at the end of the talk with System Tap, but it should give you an introduction so that you can at least get started and uh, be able to experiment with it on your own, and then later ask questions uh, on the various forms that we have. Okay, so you may have heard what System Tap is. We'll talk a bit about what it is. We'll talk a little bit, very high detail, high level detail about how it works. We'll talk about setting up System Tap so that you can use it on your own system. We'll run through a very simple example, a Hello World example, to kind of give you an idea of, okay, <clears throat> here's what the code looks like. And then we'll go through some of the ready run examples that come with System Tap. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the user space probing that's available in System Tap on uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and on Fedora. And then we'll talk about some of the common techniques with System Tap and writing your own scripts. And finally, where to get more information. So, System Tap is a dynamic scripting uh, tracing tool. Uh, the big advantage is, is that it, you don't need to recompile the code to um, instrument things. And you don't, as a result, you don't need to reinstall the executable, and you don't need to restart the system or restart the daemon. So <clears throat> it instruments things even while they're running. And so that gives a big advantage if, for example, you have a problem that, that pops up, you can instrument things while the system's still running. The scripting language has a lot of nice constructs in it. You can do conditional constructs to uh, filter things out. So rather than having a huge log file and then post-processing, you can look just at the things that you're interested in when you're collecting the data and discard the things that you're not interested in when running the script. And then also, a common tool that's used in there is associative array. So you can match up an event that happens in one place, and you want to um, record that information and then look at it at a, at a different place. And those associative arrays allow you to kind of match up events happening in different places and correlate data. And then you can also, um, you also have statistics and histograms to do simple analysis of the data, you know, like minimum, maximum, average, uh, get a histogram to show, you know, how many samples there are of different sizes to kind of give you a picture of what's going on. How does system tap work? This is, as I said, a really high level view. So the scripts are composed of probed events and probe handlers. So the events are like, for example, entering a function or a timer fires or um, you, know, you have a, a particular trace point encountered. Those are the events. And then when those events are encountered, there's a piece of code that runs with that event. You know, it may record some information associated with that event. It may um, you know, look at some other information that was stored earlier in one of those associative arrays. Um, and so that's kind of how the scripts are, are, are written up. And we'll see that in more detail when we look at some of the examples. So SystemTap is producing a kernel module from the script. It maps those probed events uh, to kernel mechanisms such as U-trace, K-probes, and timers to, get, um, uh, to, to actually uh, implement those things. And the probe handlers are translated into C code and uh, executed when those uh, events happen. And there is code in there for, for safety checks and stuff like that. Okay. To actually install System Tap, of course you'll need to install the System Tap RPM. You'll also need uh, a System Tap runtime RPM, which has the, the runtime stuff. So if you imagine the System Tap RPM is the translator converts the script into something that runs. The System Tap dash runtime has the stuff if you're just running those already built scripts. And I'll, I'll talk uh, about that a little bit more um, later time. So to actually build those um, scripts, you also need to um, have the kernel devel RPM installed because you're building that kernel module. And if you're instrumenting things in the kernel, you probably need the kernel debug info and the kernel debug info dash common to provide information about data types that are being passed into functions and stuff like that. Um, so those are the sort of supporting RPMs you need. Um, to make a life a little bit easier to get these things for like RHEL 5, what you'll need to do is, is those are available from FTP site at redhat.com. You can get them there. 
You can also use yum in RHEL 5 and just use a debug info dash install in whatever the particular version of the kernel you're running um, and get that information. For RHEL 6, it's a little bit different. You need to add additional channels to get those additional RPMs like the debug info RPMs. And for example, for RHEL 6 workstation, you need to have RHEL 6, this is for my x86 machine for example, uh, RHEL x86-64 workstation dash 6 dash debug info and um, the, the other two are for optional uh, packages that, that are sometimes needed. So those are additional channels that you may need to um, get system tab set up on RHEL 6. You can add those with a, a RHN dash channel command and you do dash add and whatever the additional uh, channels are you need. And once you have that set up, you can do debug info dash install and, and install the debug infos. Okay. Now to get system tap set up, of course you just do a, a yum install system tap, assuming that you have access to the yum repositories. Uh, to make life a little bit easier, uh, system tap includes command slash user slash bin slash stat dash prep, system tap RPM, and that will tell you exactly which RPMs need to be installed to run system tap. To run system tap, you also need to, to have permissions. Um, I mean, you could instrument and you can get lots of data out. Um, and so to kind of control the use of system tap, um, you need to be a member of a stat user if you're running the precompiled scripts. Um, if someone builds a script for you, you need to be a, a member of stat user to, to run that. Um, to build the system tap scripts from the actual scripts that we'll be using as examples, you need to be a member of, of uh, the stat dev group. Or, you know, of course you could be root and you can, you can run things as root. Okay. So this is the very simple example I was talking about. Um, this is a hello world which um, people probably have seen in every programming language they can possibly imagine. Um, and what you see is you see the, the probe begin at the, the top there and this is saying that when the script first starts up, I want to run the body, the, the handler for this probe. And so there are two statements in there. One is that printf which is going to print out hello world which looks pretty, pretty standard. The other statement is the exit which is saying that when you execute that exit statement it's saying shut down system tap and you know, shut everything down and, and leave the, the script. So um, that's useful for like if you want to shut down your script and when you know that I've collected the data that I wanted, you can just put an exit in there and it will, it will exit the script. Running this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you just type in stap hello.stp and uh, it outputs hello world. It's really, there are different ways to exit a script. Um, one way is using control C to interrupt it and that will stop a script. Uh, the exit function is another way as we already saw. The third way is um, there's a, a dash C option which allows you to run commands with the script. So if you imagine you have some instrumentation you want to run and you have some little shell script that reproduces your problem, you could um, do dash C in whatever the, the shell script uh, executable name is and run that. And what will happen is, is it System tap will start the instrumentation up running. It will then start your command. It will run the command. When that command finishes, it will then shut down the instrumentation. So this is useful if you want to run things in an automated fashion and you have something that reproduces the problem or uh, something that you want to measure. You could just run it for the duration of that particular executable with that dash C command. Now, system tap. One of the things that we've tried to do is make it a bit easier to, to play around with. And so we've included a number of ready to run scripts with it. And so there's this catalog of system tap scripts. So if we go into slash user, slash share, slash doc, slash system tap dash 1.6 slash examples, in there we'll see some indices with short descriptions, um, both in HTML and in text. So if I go into Go into that directory. We can see what I'm talking about right here. Um, let's see in the examples directory. Oops. 
Um, so here's just the text. And it's just describing all those examples. Um, and so what you'll see is they're <coughs> grouped together um, kind of uh, by kind of what things they do. And there's a little short description of what each one of them does. And we're going to go through a few of them now and, and take a look at them. Okay? And we'll also describe how, how this step works in a bit more detail when we're going through those examples. So let me just go to the next slide. So the first example I'm going to go through is this um, IO stats uh, .stp example. And what it's doing is monitoring things on the um, virtual file system level, the reads and writes. And this is going to generate statistics for each one of the executables. It's going to tell you the number of reads and write operations for each of those executables, the total amount of data that's read or written for each one of those executables, and the average size of the reads and writes. And so if someone had an application and they wanted to find out is this application doing lots of very small reads and writes, or is it doing you know a few relatively large ones? We can use this to kind of gauge you know whether it's a lot of small operations or a lot of large operations, and we could change the way it outputs things to give us a little bit more detail. But um, for this example, uh, it just will go into that directory. Okay, and so this is the example, and, and what we see is, um, and it's pretty typical for a lot of these examples, you'll see some global variables that we have here, opens, reads, writes, and totals. And then we have a probe begin that just tells us that we are um, starting <coughs> the execution, and then we have uh, a series of additional um, probe events and handlers. So we can look at the, um, We'll look at the read return here, and what we see is is that when we do a, a system call read, when we return from that, um, we're taking that return value, which is the putting in a local variable count. We're going to take a look and see if that count is greater than zero <coughs> or equal to zero, because if it's less than zero, that's an indication of error condition, and we don't want to count that. Right? If it's greater than zero. Then what we're going to do is we're going to um, <coughs> record the executable name, which is that exec name, so we can get that information. And then we're going to um, put that information in statistical arrays for read. So that's what that read is. And we're using, this is uh, using an associative array. So we're keying it off the executable name. So for each executable, that name, we're putting that value in there. So if you imagine it's like that little uh, sigma plus key on most calculators. And later we can look at that information when we uh, end the script. Uh, we also are keeping track of the uh, totals for each one of the executables for the total amount of data read and written by, by each one. If we look at the, the right uh, return, we see it looks pretty much the same with the exception that we're, we're storing into this right uh, associated array. Okay, and then at when the script ends, we see we're printing out a bunch of stuff here. So these first couple lines are just printing out headers. Okay, and then the thing that actually does prints out the interesting information for us is this for each, which is saying that for each one of the named executables in the totals array, that other associative array, it's going to um, sort things from the largest total to the smallest. So that's what that little minus sign is after totals is indicating. And it's going to limit us to printing out the first 20 entries. So that's what that limit 20 is doing. And for each one of those things, it's just going to print out the data. You know, you know we have a, a formatted print here, and it's, you know, then it's going to print out the name, the number of opens we have on the on that executable, <coughs> the um, number of reads, um, the sum, so the total amount of data that was written, and this is, uh, I guess, scaling it so it's going to be in kilobytes. That's what the um, greater than greater than ten is doing. It's scaling it, and then um, we do pretty much the same thing with the writes. So we can just run this now. So we can just do stat, IO stat, and we can run it for, for a, 
a little bit here. It should print out our message saying it's starting up. Okay, it's starting. It's recording data. Then I can just hit Control C, and it will print out this information here, so we can see um, what what things are doing reads and writes in the system. Uh, and we can we can see in the column the read bytes average. We can see that um, for XORG the average size is 417 bytes. Um, and we see for some things like for example Firefox. Uh, I don't know what Firefox is doing, but it's doing really small, small reads and writes. Uh, the the average size is one, so it's pretty small. But we can use this to kind of gauge, um, you know, the the size of the the reads and writes on the system. Okay. So the next example we have is is uh, process polling. So this is in um, monitoring the system calls that can time out. And this is really useful in terms of um, finding out which things are waking up for, for no real reason other than the, the timeout expires rather than actually having useful work to do. So like if we were trying to run a bunch of things on a virtual machine, uh, you know, on virtual machines, we want to have them wake up as rarely as possible. And so this script would give us an indication of which things are waking up because they're timing out. So for this one, let's just uh, step uh, timeout.stp. So we'll start it running. And what we'll do is we'll get a top like output here. And we can see that, um, well, S -op, um, Open Office is polling some. Uh, Firefox is also polling some. It's got a few texts that, that's timing out there. Um, if I Start up Firefox and um, have Flash running. We could, we would see that that polling going up very quickly. But this gives us an idea of of what's waking up on the system, and we can use that to um, try to tune the system. You know, there might be things that we could go, oh well, we don't need to have Postmaster running. We could turn that off um, to avoid the needed wake ups. So I can hit Control C to stop it. Okay, we can look at the script now and see how it collects this information. So we can see that um, we have some global arrays at the beginning here to store the information for each one of those system calls that can time out. And then we have, um, for example, for the syscall.poll and syscall epoll wait, what we're doing is we're going to record a bit of information about the timeout. So when, when we enter those system calls, we're going to store that information in the TO array, and we're going to key it based on the process ID. So if we have an actual timeout value, we're going to store that value in there. And then we can see in the next um, probe that uh, we're going to look at the process ID. We're going to see if our return value is um, zero, which indicates that we don't have anything useful. And we're going to also take a look and see if we actually have a timeout value. That's what that TO, um, that's what this is doing right here. It's saying if we return zero because we, we timed out and we actually had a timeout value recorded, then we're going to count that as a timeout. And so we're going to increment a couple um, global um, arrays, the values for that particular process ID. And we're also going to record the process name. And we're no longer need that timeout value, so we delete it. And so that's pretty much how most all of these um, entries work for the timeout uh, example. And if we go down to the bottom, we can see this is the actual thing that's printing out the data. So every second it's going to go through, it's going to clear the screen, it's going to print out the header, the process ID, the various um, call names, and it's just going to go through and, and uh, sort things from uh, the process that has the largest number of timeouts to smallest. So that's what that uh, for each is doing there. And we just print out each one of those rows. Now, another example I have is, is for uh, page faults. Um, I know that Linux, you can get some information about the number of major and minor page faults. However, that information is often not detailed enough. You want to find out 
exactly when and where that page fault is happening. So this example uh, is just going to print out a log with uh, a timestamp saying when that occurred. It's going to print out the process ID. So this is doing it system wide so we, we know which process actually encounters the page fault. And then this is one of the key things here, the, the virtual address. We're actually going to print out the virtual address that that uh, page fault occurs at. So we could actually look at the uh, PMAP information and we could take a look and say, oh, okay, that is um, happening in this particular shared library or this file, which allows us to, to get a better picture of what is actually going on. And we're going to record the, the read, whether it's a read or write, and then uh, whether it's a major page fault or a minor page fault. And the difference is that uh, minor page faults do not require any I.O. Uh, major page faults uh, require I.O. and it may actually go to sleep. And then finally, on each line, we're going to print out the amount of elapsed time for handling each one of those page faults. So. We'll just start this running and then we'll uh, take a look at how it actually works. So, okay, so it's running now and we, we have, we don't have a whole lot going on in the machine. If I start up something new, like the calculator maybe, we'll see a bunch of additional page faults as, as we actually start up something. Okay. <coughs> and so what we can see is, is the uh, minor page faults are, are taking on the order of maybe a single digit number of microseconds. Um, major page faults take a lot more. So if we go scroll up a bit here, yeah, we see a major page fault right here. So we can take a look at this information and get a better idea of what's going on in the system. So, and in this example, we'll hit Control C to stop it. It is pretty simple-minded. So we have um, our global arrays as, as usual in, the, in most examples. And then what we're doing is, is that we have um, a probe just begin, which is just recording kind of a, okay, T0 is when we start up the script, and that's all that's doing right there. And then we're, we're, um, when we enter a page fault, we're going to record the time of day. We're going to record the process ID. We're going to record, um, that information in, in the time global array. We're going to record the address that it's faulting at, and we're also going to record whether it's a read or write and all that stuff. So that's what we're doing on entry. Now, at that point, we don't actually know what kind of fault it is. It could be um, an illegal memory access. It could be um, uh, you know, any number of different reasons for it faulting. It may not be a major or minor page fault. We have to wait until we do the um, the return from the, the page fault to actually figure that out. And so um, the return here, we're going through, we're going to get the time of day, of course. We're going to get the process ID so we can match it up to the, the entry. And then what you see is, is that um, if we don't have, right here, this line is just saying, um, if we don't have an entry for the time, entry time, we don't have any information about this particular one. So don't do the rest of the body of this um, this handler. Uh, if we if we've gotten that far, we can figure out the elapsed time, and that's what E is right there. Now we still need to figure out what kind of page fault this was, and so this if uh, if then else is determining whether it's a, a minor page fault. Okay, and if it's minor, then we're going to set our F type as minor. If it's a major page, page fault, we'll set it as, as major. Uh, if it's something else, you know, like a um, illegal memory access or something like that, or we don't want to deal with it. So we just, um, the next just means we skip out. We don't bother to handle the rest of the, the, um, uh, the, the handler. And if we've made it past that last next, we actually print out that information. So we're just, right here, we're just printing that out. And at that point, we're done. And then what you'll see is, is that we're doing some, some deletes here because um, system tap, the associated arrays are very flexible, but there are a limited number of slots to store things. And so 
when we are no longer uh, need those values, we should delete them. And that's what the deletes do. They just clear up those, those old entries and free them up for other uses. Because all the memory allocation in SystemTap is done uh, on startup. When the script is actually running, there's no dynamic memory allocation. So that uh, you, know, you need to free things up to avoid running out of space in the uh, associated arrays. Now, I, I do want to talk a little bit about user space probing. Um, the RHEL and Fedora kernels do support user space probing. Um, there are a number of example packages built with SystemTap support like Postgres, MySQL, Mozilla, and Python, and Java. Generally, the difference between those is you'll see that they'll have the, the probe events will be process, the path to the executable, and then you'll have like dot .function, whatever the function name is. Or um, for those packages that are built with system have support, you'll see like, for example, process Postgres dot mark lock wait start or something like that. And on the system, I do have um, the uh, Python stuff installed, so we can uh, just I can just show you that running real quick here. So, okay. So, in the Python package, you'll notice that there's a couple STP files, uh, and so there, the first two are examples, and the last one is the actual tap set. So, um, tap sets are uh, aliases that make it easier for people to use system tap. So, rather than having to know what precise function to instrument. We, if we look at, let's say, um, this pi function top, what you'll see is you'll see stuff like, like uh, python.function.entry, and you don't have to know that there's a, a, a marker for that. It's just already there. And what this one does is it, uh, if we run it, it's going to give you a top-like output showing um, the process ID, the file name, what line, um, what the function is, and how many times that's, that is called. I don't have any Python running right now, but if I, uh, if I do an <coughs> update, you know, um, a yum update, we can see the, the process ID on the left, and we can see that <coughs> the file name that those particular things are coming from, and the line number, and it tells us um, Kind of what's taking time on the system, so I can, I guess, stop that. So, so that that's an example of user space stuff. Um, now, the I mentioned the the tap sets. What you'll see is for a lot of the packages. Um, that have that user space support, they'll have these tap sets to make life easier. <clears throat> so this, in this case right here, um, this is actually providing uh, the stuff for that python.function.entry. It's mapping it to uh, Python and, and a particular marker. And then it also provides some variable names with values in them. So you don't have to um, figure out what those are. It just gives you file name, file function, the function name, and line number. So that's an example of the user space probing uh, that's available in a lot of the packages that we have for <coughs> for RHEL and for Fedora. Now, um, common uses for SystemTap, um, you can use it as a kind of a super S trace. Um, it's useful for determining whether a particular function is called. If you have a problem, you go, hey, um, you know, there's three different ways that this could be triggering this problem, and it could be this function, that function, or this third function. And you could probe each one of those and determine which one is actually causing the problem. Um, you can also get tracebacks to determine what's calling that function. So if you, you know that, okay, I got to this function, this function is causing the problem, but where is it being called from? Um, you can use the uh, uh, tracebacks to determine that information. Uh, alternatively, you may go, well, I know that it's calling a function, but maybe there's something being passed in bogus. You could look at the actual arguments. Um, this step allows you to look at those, those variables and uh, get the values out and extract like, fields from, from structures and stuff like that. You could also look at um, which process or thread is triggering an event. You know, like a um, common example 
is if you have, let's say, something keeps getting killed, you know, a, a signal sent to, to kill it, you want to know what's sending that signal. So there's a SigKill.sp example which actually will tell you which thing is sending SigKill each time a SigKill is sent. Um, you could also use it for uh, determining time between events. You could have, an, you could, as you saw in some examples, we record, um, like for example, on the uh, page fault, we record when we entered the page fault, and then when we returned from the page fault, we looked at the time again, and we looked at the difference between that time and got a, a um, uh, indication of how much time it took to do do something. So, just a little bit more on the super uh, S trace. So, S trace is really useful. Uh, but it does have its limitations. Um, S trace can only monitor a single process. Um, there are limits on what it can filter. Uh, it can't filter on return values. So if you wanted to only pay attention to things that are returning um, error conditions, it doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, you may end up getting like a really verbose uh, log file from S trace and then having to post process it. System tap allows you to monitor things system wide. So if you have maybe some odd interaction between two different things, you could look at the system calls on both of those processes and look at the order that they're occurring and match them up easily, which would be difficult to do with two separate S trace things running at the same time because it doesn't have that time information. And then you could also do more flexible filtering. You could look at the return values, as I mentioned earlier. Now, for writing your own, ver uh, own system app scripts. Uh, you can use the ex existing examples as a starting point. Um, I just went through a couple examples. There are other examples that we have in there. Um, you know, for like uh, TC <coughs> excuse me, TCP or NFS, you can look at those. Those are probably probing the things that you're interested in. They may not be providing the data and output in the way that, you're, that you want it, but you could go through and, and adjust those. You can also go through and you can um, uh, find po possible pro points, uh, you can do the dash L option. So if you want to see what's available, like for example, what trace points are available in the kernel, you could do that, that command right there with a, a staff dash L, kernel dot trace, um, quotation mark, star, quotation mark, uh, close parenthesis, and that print out all the trace points you have available in that particular kernel. Of course, we've also got a lot of man pages for system tap. Uh, you can look through also the uh, tap sets that we have. We try to make it so that um, the system tap reference manual, uh, the tap set reference manual, has information about each one of the tap sets that we have. Um, you can also look through the source co uh, source code of the kernel or your user space application to kind of see how things are operating and figure out what you want to probe. I know that. Working with the kernel is, is uh, difficult. Um, you know, there's just a lot of files and things are spread across lots of different things. Um, there's a couple of things that make it a little bit easier to, to navigate the kernel. Uh, the Linux kernel cross-reference, there's one for the rel kernels, which is at http colon slash slash source3.org. And there's a similar one for upstream kernels. Um, at http colon slash slash lxr dot linux dot no slash linux slash and that those you can click on and and look at um, I know I have this function. I can click on that function, it will show you a list of all of uses of that function, you know, where it's defined, the uses and so on. You could also click on variables, look at the data structures and so on. So it's really useful for <coughs> seeing how things are connected in the kernel. Uh, and, and I would encourage you to, to, to look at that if you're, if you're trying to uh, figure out how things are working. Um, as I mentioned, this talk is it's an introductory talk, and I'm sure that there's lots of other things that you want to learn about SystemTap. Um, we have a beginner's guide uh, available on the Red Hat pages, and you can look at that um, for more information uh, on SystemTap and uh, some more examples. We also have a system tap project page um, at http colon slash slash sourceware dot org system tap. And <clears throat> there's also um, uh, we have email uh, system tap at sources dot redhat dot com and there's an IRC channel pound system tap on IRC dot freenode dot net. And 
you know, feel free to, to make use of those to learn more about System Tap. Um, once you have a, a script that you think is a really cool script, I would encourage you to submit it for the examples. A um, couple reasons to do that. One is, is it you can improve the quality of the, the uh, script because um, the system tap engineers will look at it and go, oh well, <clears throat> it might be better to do this particular uh, operation in this manner, uh, and and that feedback could improve the quality of the script. Uh, another thing is that you're probably looking at running that script on one machine or a couple machines. Um, when we include those examples, we put them in the test suite. And so when people run those test suites, let's say on, on uh, Fedora ARM or uh, other machines, they're also run on there and they're also run on those other kernels. And so when newer versions of RHEL come out, uh, we can be more confident that that script will work on those newer versions of kernel. There are details about submitting those examples uh, in the, um, the examples uh, directory. There's a readme file in there. You can look at that and, and uh, find out the details of, of submitting. So the, exa uh, the examples are on our, our system tap web page. There's also, um, if you go on there, there's also a bunch of other documentation on there. 